On August 29, 1939, Joel Schumacher was born in New York City, the son of Francis Schumacher, a Baptist from Knoxville, Tennessee, and Marion Schumacher, who was born Marion Cantor, who was a Swedish Jew. His father died when Joel was four, and he was raised by his mother. During his youth, he used LSD and methamphetamine and started alcohol by age nine. In 1965, he graduated from Parsons School of Design after having studied at the Fashion Institute of Technology and later became a designer for Revlon in 1966. At the time of his mother's death in 1965, Schumacher stated that his life seemed like a joke as he was $50,000 in debt, lost multiple teeth, and only weighed 130 pounds. But in 1970, he stopped using drugs and became employed at Henry Bendel. In 1972, Schumacher served as costume designer for Play It As It Lays and designed the wardrobes for Diane Cannon, Joan Hackett, and Raquel Welch for the film The Last of Sheila. In 1973, he served as a costume designer for Woody Allen's Sleeper and Paul Mazursky's Bloom in Love. In 1974, he served as the production designer for Killer Bees. He later served as a costume designer for The Time of the Cuckoo, The Prisoner of Second Avenue, and Interiors. In 1974, Schumacher wrote a script for an eponymous biographic made-for-TV movie based on the life of Virginia Hill. He was selected to serve as the movie's director. Also in 1974, he and Howard Roseman wrote the script for Sparkle, which later went into production in 1975 and was released in 1976. He wanted the film to be a black Gone with the Wind, but had to be modest due to the limited budget given to the production by Warner Brothers. He was later selected to write the screenplays for Car Wash, released in 1976, and The Wiz, released in 1978. Also in 1978, Schumacher was selected to serve as the director of Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill, which was released in 1979. In 1980, he submitted a script for A Chorus Line, but the film underwent rewrites. Also in 1979, he was selected to serve as the director of The Incredible Shrinking Woman, his first theatrically released film, to replace John Landis, who left after Universal Pictures had reduced the film's budget. In 1981, the film was released in negative reviews and was a box office bomb. In 1983, he directed DC Cab, starring Mr. T, but he later stated that he only worked on the film as he needed a job. In 1984, Schumacher was selected by Columbia Pictures to direct St. Elmo's Fire. In 1987, he directed The Lost Boys. Both films were successful among young people and were his first major critical and commercial successes. Following The Lost Boys, Schumacher directed Cousins, released in 1989, Flatliners, released in 1990, Dying Young, released in 1991, and finally Falling Down, released in 1993. I purchased this DVD on Amazon for $9.99, which is well below my self-imposed limit of $13.91. Uh, thus, the, this DVD does qualify for a low-budget review. It should be noted that this is the 2009 DVD release, and there's only one disc. Um, I was hoping there'd be a 25th anniversary edition, but the 25th anniversary would, would have taken place in 2018, so there wasn't, and uh, there was, um, for the War Games, there was like the 25th Anniversary Deluxe Edition in, in uh, 2008. Um, so yeah, this, uh, the 25th Anniversary would take place in 2018. So apparently, it, it doesn't exist. When someone does this... Where are you going? 
you pay a go. Give us your briefcase. Give me some money. There's other people waiting to use the phone here. Get off my golf course. I want to be a parking lot. I'll buy a ticket. Don't you want to do this? <laughs> You forgot the briefcase! On February 26th, Bill Foster does what you always wanted to. Cool, man. Academy Award winner Michael Douglas, Falling Down, rated R. Start Friday, February 26th. The film opens in a traffic jam in Los Angeles. William Foster, played by Michael Douglas, who is a divorced and laid-off defense worker, is stuck in traffic on a hot day. It's his daughter Adele's birthday, so unable to bear the heat as his car's air conditioner doesn't work and all the chaos around him, he abandons his economy car and sets out on foot. Sergeant Martin Prendergast, played by Robert Duvall, who is a veteran cop on his last day before retirement. Um, and just for the record, he is taking early retirement at, re at a reduced pension to placate his somewhat unstable wife, played by Tuesday Weld. Well, he helps push it out of traffic, noting his personalized license plate, Defense. That's uh, Delta Dash uh, Foxtrot Echo November Sierra Defense. At a convenience store, Foster gets into an altercation with Mr. Lee, played by Michael Paul Chan, who's the Korean owner, over the high price of a can of soda. Foster destroys many of the products in the store with Lee's baseball bat before leaving. Lee reports this incident to the police. Shortly after, while resting on a hill, Foster uses shredded newspapers to cover over a hole in one of his shoes. Then he is accosted by two gang members who demands his briefcase at knife point. He drives them off with the bat, taking their drop knife. Foster then calls his ex-wife Beth, played by Barbara Hershey, from a payphone, announcing his intention of arriving for their daughter's birthday, much to her displeasure, as she has filed a restraining order against him. As he's on the phone with her, Foster is shot out by the vengeful gang members in the drive-by shooting. However, their aim is inaccurate, and he escapes unharmed. Uh, their car crashes, leaving several gang members injured. Approaching the wreckage, he shoots a surviving gang member in, in the leg with their gun before leaving, taking their bag of weapons. Prendergast realizes there's a connection between the assault on Mr. Lee and the gangland altercation. Foster cuts through a park uh, in the meantime, and a panhandler asks for him for money. Instead, he gives the panhandler his briefcase, which only contains his lunch. Foster stops at Whammy Burger, a fast food establishment where he wants breakfast, but it's 11.33 a.m., and the cashier, who is played by Dee Dee Pfeiffer, who is actually the younger sister of Michelle Pfeiffer, tells him that they're on the lunch menu. Foster insists that he wants breakfast and pulls an, an assault weapon out of the bag, causing a panic in the restaurant. Eventually, he changes his mind and orders lunch, but is dissatisfied with the burger's poor quality in comparison to the menu picture. Prendergast and his ex-partner Sandra Torres, who's played by Rachel Tocotton, have lunch, uh, but Torres is interrupted by the disturbance at Whammy Burger, which causes Prendergast to investigate Foster's attacks, mapping his location using witnesses' description of him. Um, after buying a birthday gift for his daughter, Foster enters a surplus store to buy new shoes. Uh, Nick, played by Frederick Forrest, who is the Nazi store owner, helps him evade capture when Taurus arrives to question him. Nick shows Foster his private stash of weapons and praises him for the Whammy Burger incident. But Foster is disgusted by Nick's racism and tries to leave. Uh, Nick is furious and attempts to arrest Foster, but he stabs Nick's, Nick with the gang member's knife and shoots him dead. He calls Beth from the surplus store, where he again states his, in, his intention to be there for his daughter's birthday. He changes into an army outfit and continues on his journey. 
first he blows up a construction site then he climbs over the fence at a country club and causes a golfer to suffer a heart attack along the, on the way and he, he basically takes out a shotgun and shoots the golf cart and uh, causes the golf cart to fall into a, a hazard water hazard uh, Prendergast and Torres visit Foster's mother and realize that Foster is headed towards Venice, the location of his ex-wife and daughter's home. They both arrive at the house, but Foster arrived first and he shoots and wounds Torres before escaping to the pier. There he confronts Beth and Adele, Adele is his daughter, uh, but Prendergast arrives and with Beth, Beth's help manages to disarm Foster, and Prendergast orders him to surrender. Foster, unwilling to see his daughter grow up behind bars, forces Prendergast to shoot him by pulling a water pistol on him, thus committing suicide by cop. He falls uh, off the pier into the water, still clutching the water pistol. Afterwards, a news team has assembled at Beth's house where Prendergast curses his superior um, he tells Beth not to tell Adele what has happened until tomorrow. Then tells Adele that his name is Mud. Once he tells his wife that he's still a cop. The last scene is inside the house with a videotape playing of Foster, Beth, and Adele when they were still a family. I'm the bad guy? How'd that happen? I did everything they told me to. Did you know that I build missiles? I help to protect America. You should be rewarded for that. Instead, they give it to the plastic surgeons. You know, they lied to me. Uh, thus says Bill Defense Foster uh, towards the end of the movie. Um, there are so many ways to analyze this movie, but I'm going to start with the title of this movie. Falling Down is, quite simply, about a man falling down. Bill Foster is an average schmo who ha has lost his job, his family, and over the course of the movie, his sense of meaning, sense of purpose, if you will. If you And I think the thesis of the movie is that if you deprive a, a man of these supports, he will, in a literal and figurative sense, fall down. Uh, this movie essentially chronicles the fall of Bill Foster. Um, in reality, it was probably happening before this movie. In the old videos of, of his family, they start to see his instability and ye uh, yelling at his wife and daughter. But we don't see that at this point. And his grievances seem to be legitimate. Um, he, he abandons his car on the freeway and goes into a bodega to get changed for a phone call. The owner says they must purchase something first. He buys a Coke and the cost, which is 85 cents, which seems kind of like cheap now, but anyway, uh, does not leave him changed for a phone call. Although he's quick to resort to violence, we can sympathize with Foster. Um, so he's like this everyman type of, 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 of uh, person who just like goes to extremes. Um, he actually resorts to physical violence and trashes the store. Um, and then he's attacked by two gang members who get their comeuppance. With Foster being them with a baseball bat, which makes me quiver with glee. He even gets their gym bag full of guns when they attack him in revenge. Um, he pulls his gun out when he doesn't get satisfaction at a fast food place, and anybody who had an unpleasant experience at one of these places can sympathize with him. Um, the turning point in the movie came for me when uh, he kills the, the Nazi owner of the surplus store. Um, very likely nobody's going to miss him, but killing him was unjustified. This is where um, he, when he, when he kills somebody, this is where he, he really uh, dis, uh, can't is past the, as he says on the on, on the phone with his his uh, his ex-wife, he's past the point of no return. Um, Similarly, his attacks on the construction site and the golf course are harder to justify. And then you start to see that this is an unhinged man. We see later on the video of him with his wife and his daughter. And this man needs to be shut down. Um, that's where Prendergast comes in. 
Um, reports of defense rampage come into the police department, and the only one to piece together and find out the attacks are related is Sergeant Martin Prendergast, uh, played by Robert Duvall. He he first incur, encounters Foster during his commute, and we see the similarities between the characters. Uh, so basically, they, both of them have a, a white shirt and, uh, on and a tie, and both seem kind of average. Uh, um, Prendergast is retiring early, taking a reduced pension to satisfy the demands of his somewhat crazy wife, played by Tuesday Weld. And here you can see that although he's a cop, He's belittled by almost everybody around him, um, except for Sandra Torres, um, who's played by Rachel Takadin, who's his friend on the police force and someone with, with this is the vibe that I get, he's like somebody that, that he may have uh, had an affair with. Um, anyway, uh, you, 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 you get this vibe, well, uh, you kind of get this, like, the idea that he, He's belittled by everyone around him. You get this almost immediately uh, when the motorcycle cop at the beginning of the movie tells him to get back in his car. Well, then he flashes his badge to the cop and tells him that he's 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 a cop himself, and that's enough for the cop to say, "Okay, well, you can push push the car while I steer it." And then um, he knocks over the cop's motorcycle, and and the cop yells at him. Uh, so this is a guy who gets gets no respect. Not from his co-workers, who resent the fact that he's interfering with their investigation. Not from his boss, who seems to distrust him because he doesn't cuss. Um, and who is this guy? Um, who is uh, Captain Bill Yardley, uh, played by Raymond J. Barry. Um, so yeah, Captain Bill Yardley doesn't trust him. Um, and uh, definitely not from his wife. As Foster descends further to rock bottom, we start to see Prendergast redeeming himself by solving the case. By the end of the movie, he has achieved redemption, standing up to his co-workers, um, one of whom he punches for insulting his wife. This is the uh, partner of uh, Sandra Torres. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the what the what his name was, but that is the partner of Sandra Torres. Um, and also to his wife, who he yells it over the phone, and finally his boss, who he dismisses with, F you, Captain, F you very much. Um, he regains his uh, manliness without really hurting anyone. Uh, Foster, on the other hand, has gone completely off the deep end, which leaves you to wonder, was he inherently unstable and doomed to follow the path of uh, no matter what happened to him, or was he an un unstable person who, who cracked once he lost his job and his family. In this movie, there's enough evidence to reach both conclusions. On a, a larger scale, this, move, this movie explores broader general themes. It covers urban decay. Most of us have a job. who have a job have a commute. You go from home to work. At the end of the day, you go from work to home. And seldom do we explore the pla places we pass by each day. The only way you can do this is by walking. And here, Schumacher takes us on a journey through an urban hellscape that is Los Angeles and um, basically this was being filmed uh, around the times of the LA riots of 1992 so about like um, was it a uh, late April early May um, so along with uh, foreign bodega owners gangbangers annoying panhandlers neo-nazis scummy entitled construction workers, insolent fast food workers, and once we've crossed out of the low rent district, rude country club members. Um, one of the lessons that we might learn from this movie is that people in California are jerks, but maybe I'm being uncharitable as many of the negative aspects of cities can probably be replicated in any number of cities within a 25 mile radius of, of uh, where I'm doing this recording. Um, another theme is that the people laid off, in, in, and uh, Michael Douglas talks about this, that um, at the end of the Cold War, um, they were, uh, when, when uh, the Berlin Wall came down and and uh, the 
the Soviet Union collapse, which happened in December of 91. Um, a lot of people saw this as like, oh, we, this is a peace dividend, so we, we, we don't need to spend as much on defense. So a lot of these def defense companies uh, laid off, uh, they gave pinks up to people. And so this is like, basically, this is what uh, happens to Bill Foster. So, you know, he's a laid off defense worker. Um, so the, the, another theme of this movie laid off in, in the recession late Bush early Clinton era uh, the Reagan years were by and large boom years for the economy despite the country suffering through a recession in the early 1980s but then the country suffered through a recession in the early 1990s part of it was cyclical but part of it wasn't the Cold War essentially ended in late 90, 1991 with the break of the Soviet Union, there was a sense that defense spending could be somewhat less. Yeah, I imagine that some companies found that the big government contracts weren't there, and that workers had to be laid off. Uh, and and this is the first recession where people who were laid off didn't find work. And I I know it's because I I lived through it. Um, initially, they they thought that they were going to find jobs for more or less the same income they had made before, uh, but essentially their job skills were obsolete. So by the time um, their expectation had been adjusted to reality, it was too late. They'd been without a job for too long. Um, so it was different from other recessions. And, and uh, so um, this is a true story. Um, I went to work in, 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 in software for a manufacturing company in, in New Jersey. And uh, there was... Um, a mechanical engineer who, who worked there for about like uh, I think he was there for like a five uh, he was there since like early 1991 um, so he told me that he was laid off from, from the company that he was at and um, I don't know how much he was making but he was probably making like high five figures low six figures so he um, he worked for, he worked for the company that that um, that we were working at for half the salary that he was making, and so that's basically what you had to do. Basically, either, either you were without work or you worked for like half the salary. Um, basically, you know, this is the first the first recession where middle aged people with considerable job experience were getting laid off initially they thought yeah um so um it was different from other recessions in the past it was given that every few years there'd be a recession people would get laid off but it was only temporary and then they get they get their jobs back with about the same salary as before um so in the 80s you had an eight-year economic boom followed by a recession followed by another economic boom leading lasting through the 1990s, helped mostly by technology and computers, then a recession in the early 2000s, followed by a housing boom uh, that, of course, ended disastrously in the housing bust and the, the Great Recession. Um, so that's one of the themes, this, um, basically hard times. Um, yeah, another theme covered in this movie is changing times. Um, we get in the sense that the Venice, which Bill Foster and Beth moved to, uh, well, and then Adele, once Adele was born, uh, his daughter, um, that the, the Venice Beach, which which uh, Bill Foster and Beth moved to, was not as diverse when they moved there. And by the 1990s, it's more diverse, as is much of the city. And essentially, you get Whammy Burger, which the clientele is, is mostly black, and a Korean shopkeeper keeper who speaks broken English. Most of this is, is driven by market forces. Um, so, uh, the bodega owner is there because the supermarkets aren't there. The supermarkets uh, are not willing to open in such a high crime area. So, basically, um, the people who, the, the person who runs a bodega is, is somebody who can operate at a profit. Uh, so, so, this is just anybody who, who can uh, operate at profit. For example, a Korean. Um, so you get these these bodegas where they charge uh, like four twenty nine. I mean, some of the things like 
were reasonable, but like you know, four twenty nine for batteries, eh, it's kind of a lot. Um, and Foster himself is essentially an anachronism. With his white shirt and tie and crew cut, it's just like he stepped out of the 1950s, which may have cut in Reagan's America, which was basically a throwback to the 1950s, but it's not going to cut in the 1990s. Um, and as some viewers of, of, of Falling Down has, have, has, have perceived, um, Bill Foster cannot easily be pigeonholed. He's not a right-wing vigilante, nor a symbol of white male intolerance. Uh, he's a man who can legitimately claim that he's been victimized by people around him, yet he's also a dangerous man. He said that he did everything he was told to do. Um, my reaction to him is, is him saying that is, that's your problem. So, in a sense, I, take, I have a libertarian philosophy and I blame Foster for his current situation because to a large extent everything that happens to you is your fault but if we as a society train people to fear and obey and that's in the Dead Kennedy song uh, the song that says you went to school where you were taught to fear and to obey and we basically have these people w with a, a, type, a type of mentality to, uh, to conform and that's basically like the 1950s uh, type of mentality, uh, then, once things go wrong for them, don't expect good results. So here's uh, some other observations that I have, it's just like potpourri, but, um, let's see, falling down, uh, London Bridge is, Lon London Bridge is falling, so it's falling down, like, like in a figurative sense, to, to Foster is falling down, but also London Bridge is falling down, which is the nursery rhyme. Prendergast uh, used to calm his hysterical wife, uh, which is also the song that plays on the snow globe that Foster buys for his daughter, Adele. Um, so by the way, London Bridge is in Lake Havasu, uh, Arizona, to which Prendergast and his wife planned to move. It was built in the 1830s and spanned the Thames River. And then it was bought by uh, real estate developer Robert P. McCulloch and rebuilt stone by stone over Lake Havasu in the late 60s and early 70s. I think the, the, it was finished, completed in like 1971. Um, so this, uh, this falling down is like, this is like an area where, where uh, Joel Schumacher really ties things together. Um, the not economically guy, uh, the not economically viable guy is black man with the same uniform that Foster is wearing. Uh, when the man is being taken away by police, he says, Don't forget me, and Foster acknowledges him by nodding his head. Although he, he's somewhat different, he, he's also not economically viable. So that's like, uh, I, I don't understand why he, was, why he was being arrested, because he was just uh, protesting. Um, so anyway, um, Foster will not give up his briefcase to the gang members. Um, then he kind of arbitrarily decides that he's going to give up his briefcase to the panhandler. And this is like, so when Foster kills the Nazi store owner, um, he uh, had po passed the point of no return. But this is, in a way that he passed the point of no return when he gave, gave up his briefcase. He basically decided he's not going to be a working man. He's going to be something else. He's going to be like, Maybe a vigilante, or maybe not. Um, also, uh, Foster is so upset that the that the cashier won't serve him breakfast that he pulls a gun. Yet in the end, he decides he's going to have a, a lunch. Um, so basically, if, if uh, this man has an epitaph, it might be, "Here lies Bill Foster, principled." Oh, he had principles anyway. Um, the acting is good. Uh, and Michael Douglas says this is the best role he ever had. Um, the directing and screenplay, uh, directing by Joel Schumacher is good. Oh yes, and the screenplay is good too. Um, it was written by Ebba Rose Smith, who is an actor and hasn't written again, hasn't written any, anything else other than this. I I, I don't think. Um, but it, it'd be remiss of me not to give props to this uh, the screenplay. And again, I give props to Everett Rose Smith. Um, in conclusion, Falling Down 
is not only an excellent movie, but it stands up to repeated watching, repeated viewing, and likely you'll see something that you didn't see previously. Um, Joel Schumacher has created a classical, a classic psychological crime here, and it should rightfully serve as a notch on the directorial belt. Um, Joel Schumacher died a few years ago, and I can just imagine myself as God passing judgment over Joel Schumacher and saying, you did good. Uh, you made one classic movie. Um, yeah, you did Batman and Robin, which, uh, not my cup of tea. It, it, uh, but, uh, yeah, all is forgiven. You did good. I give this movie a 10 out of 10. So there's one addendum that I should add uh, to the, my review, which is uh, by telling Prendergrass that he has a gun and uh, getting Prendergrass to shoot him, Bill Foster is committing suicide by a cop. And suicide by a cop, by definition, is uh, when you provoke a policeman to shoot you and kill you, um, then... Uh, you've effectively committed suicide, but it's not suicide for insurance law purposes, and the insurance company will have to pay a benefit out on a life insurance policy. So, uh, in a but-backwards way, he's being the responsible adult by um, commit, uh, committing suicide by cop and getting his uh, beneficiaries to collect the life, the benefits on the life insurance policy. We don't know who the beneficiaries are. Could be his ex-wife and, and kid. Um, it could be his mother. Um, but yeah, he's being a responsible adult. It would be nice if he had been a responsible adult without rampaging through the city and killing people, but you, you can't have it all. As one might expect, for the deluxe edition of Falling Down, we get a decent amount of extras. Not a lot, but still pretty good. We get the commentary track with uh, actor Michael Douglas and the late director Joel Schumacher. There's also a documentary, Deconstructing Defense, a conversation with Michael Douglas. The documentary is only 10 minutes long, well, that's okay, because I tend to have a short attention span, so I can watch the whole documentary. Um, you can watch the movie in English, or dubbed with, fr with French. Um, there's also uh, French and English subtitles. And that's pretty much it. Ideally, there'd be two discs, with one disc having the movie, and one disc having the extras. Um, but that was not the case here. Um... So, yeah, um, I was hoping there'd be a 25th anniversary edition, but th this turned out not to be the case. But, uh, this is... Uh, DVD extras are, are adequate. Um, I, I was wishing there'd be more, but there, there weren't. But, anyway, this is pretty good. Um, I wanted to delve briefly into the content of this movie. Um, this movie is rated R for violence and strong language, there's no nudity, but there's plenty of cussing and plenty of violence. Um, so, oh wait, there's a sex and nudity, there's a, let's see, a stripper shows up at a retirement party, but the retiree leaves before the stripper can remove her clothes. Um, there's also a scene where a man attempts to rape another man at gunpoint. The perpetrator uses very graphic language and makes the victim bend over. So there's sexual situations, but no nudity. Um, oh, for, uh, for violent, violence, oh, the main character shot killed, okay, uh, oh, here, profanity, um, a store owner is shown to be a neo-Nazi, he makes several racist hom homophobic comments, oh, let's see, 57 uses of the F word, 6 uses of the S word, 3 uses of the B word, 2 uses of GD, Four uses of a word that's not the F word, but begins with F. Two uses of the N word, and one use of hell. So yes, plenty of cussing, um, plenty of violence, but 
some sexual situations, but no nudity. Um, so yeah, I felt that the, that the uh, that the content of the movie was justified. Um, so yeah, this be cognizant of that. It's rated R. The Falling Down is an excellent movie, one that withstands re repeated viewings, and that alone is reason enough to own the DVD, which, as I said earlier, cost $9.99. The DVD extras, while not overwhelming in quantity, are enough to justify the cost. I would have had a more resounding endorsement for this DVD, but unfortunately, the deluxe edition is confined to a single DVD. If the it had two DVDs, I would be much more enthusiastic about it, but unfortunately, it's just a single DVD, so I only, I only recommend this DVD. For the money, it's a solid purchase. Well, that's it for this video. Joel Schumacher died a few years ago, so this video is dedicated to the memory of Joel Schumacher, and also to the memory of Frederick Forrest, who died in uh, June of, the, of 2023 just when I was starting low budget reviews. So I need to talk about this mechanical engineer who uh, got laid off. Um, he was a mechanical engineer, but he wasn't employed in, uh, in our company as the mechanical engineer. He was basically a CAD engineer. So when he was interviewing for the job, they asked him, you know, do you think you could, you could do uh, CAD and, and where you could, uh, you know, put drawings and uh, use the computer and, and do drawings and uh, basically do CAD, you know, just computer system design. Well, he didn't know CAD because he didn't understand computers, but he said he could learn it, and, he, and on weekends he learned uh, computer system design on an old 46, running uh, AutoCAD, a pirated version of AutoCAD. I think I can say that because the Statue of Limitations probably expired, um, but yeah, he he uh, he learned uh, he upgraded his skills for a job making half as much as before because he didn't have a sense of entitlement and he had a family to support. So I think that's important to remember. Um, the previous generations didn't have a sense of entitlement. The country was built um, on on these uh, on these people who didn't have a sense of entitlement. Um, like and comment on this video and don't forget to subscribe so you'll be informed of the latest low budget review. As always, thanks for watching.